before Thursday evening Bible study. So would you stand with me, please? And turn in your songbooks to song number 415, Leaning on the Everlasting Arms. Hymn number 415. It's good to be here on Thursday night. Uh, last week, uh, I was a little under the weather. My wife was very under the weather. So I appreciate Brother Snyder preaching for us. Amen. He got down on it, and it was good. I got a lot of good comments about your preaching. So praise the Lord that uh, Brother Snyder always carries a sermon in his pocket. Be instant in season, out of season, right? All right. Uh, several things tonight. We're going to take a, just a little bit longer before we uh, before we go to our prayer time. Um, I had a, a really really great conversation last week with Brother Rue. Uh, in fact, he had he sent us a letter here that I hadn't had a chance to read, but it it said this: um, Dear Pastor Owens, members of Central Baptist, I hope this letter finds you well in the Lord and rejoicing in His blessings. Thank you for allowing me the privilege of preaching back in February. I pray it was a blessing and an, an encouragement to you all. I wanted to also thank you for your generous love offering towards a vehicle when we go back to Ukraine, as well as your hospitality and faithful prayers and support. I'm truly humbled by your care and love for us and our ministry. And I pray, I pray for you all that the Lord continues to bless you and your ministry. And then he, he called me last week, and we had a great conversation about his trip. He did go back to Ukraine. They, they were there for several days. Uh, I believe about 50 more people got saved. Uh, it's quite a story, uh, and I, I wish I had the time to tell all of it. Um, but he had a very difficult time getting money into the country so they can use the money toward a vehicle. They did find a vehicle. But uh, because of the war and things that are going on, you can't do things in a normal way. And just, just trying to get money into the country. Uh, he also was nearly arrested uh, because uh, for smuggling. And, and he had two suitcases full of chick tracks. One suitcase was, uh, this was your life, and the other one was, uh, what did he tell me? Anyway. Uh, as he was going through the airport uh, or uh, coming in, they opened his luggage and they saw it and they took his luggage and they sent him to a room and they uh, uh, wanted to talk to him about what this stuff was about, all the propaganda and whatnot. And it's, it's kind of a great story, but the Lord, uh, the Lord was in the whole thing and he was able to bring the tracks into the country. Amen. But he was told, don't do this again. Uh, but... Uh, Somehow they connected him. 
he, one of his pieces of luggage had a little logo on it, and I can't remember what he told me it was, uh, almost like a military logo, and they thought that he was part of America coming in to help or something. And so he, because they saw that, they turned him over to a military guy, and the military guy was very nice to him, and he says, now, don't just, don't do this again. And so anyway, he was able to come in. So it was a really great story, but uh, but our, the, the offering that came from Central Baptist Church was instrumental in him being able to go and, of course, being able to buy the vehicle. So uh, we want to continue to pray for uh, Brother Rue. He, he's, there, he's back in the United States. The difficulty is where, still where they're going to go and what, uh, what part of the country. And he was talking about how he was literally in meetings where the, the Russians were just like over the hill and he could hear the bombs exploding and the earth shaking and and he was just that close to to the fighting and you know the sky lighting up and all that kind of stuff he said it was a very sort of a surreal experience so anyway we want to be much in prayer for brother rue and then we got a really nice card from uh uh from uh from uh brother robinette and uh, he had a chance to go to india and here's what he said glory to god greetings dear uh, pastor and uh, Central Baptist Church family rejoice with us as 316 souls have accepted Jesus in India on our missions trip to uh, 2024. So we went to India, came back, 316 people saved. And that's what your money is going toward. Praise the Lord for that. Um, uh, again, prayers and support are a huge blessing and part of these miracles our appreciation, care, love, and prayers, and then here, uh, Brother Robinette. So uh, let's continue to keep him in prayer, and then uh, we're going to show a we're going to show a video here in a minute uh, from uh, Brother Goddard. I believe it's Brother Goddard. A couple things. Uh, I also had a really good conversation with Brother uh, Marco last night. We I, we talked for quite a while. Was it last night? You wouldn't know because I didn't tell you. Uh, he was here last night or the night before, but I uh, had a nice conversation with Brother Marco. And um, there's been some, I'll tell you what's going on. There's been a little mix up with his support. And we were sending the money every month and it was faithfully going out, but then it was coming back. And we didn't, we didn't, we weren't aware of that. And he hadn't gotten any monthly support from us for, for several months. And so, uh, he said, I think the problem is it's going to the wrong address. So we, we got the address figured out. I changed it. And then, um, and then he said, but he said, I just want to tell you, he said, the Lord was in this whole thing. He said, uh, they're up for uh, visa renewal. And he said, we didn't have the money set aside. He said, the money you're going to send us is going to take care of all of that. So we're going to, so it's, it's all going to work out for the, for the glory of the Lord. So we want to continue to pray for Brother Marco now. There's two other requests that I want to uh, want us to really diligently pray for. We're praying for Brother Rue, Brother Robinette. Uh, we want to pray that uh, inside the newsletter is the Donahoe uh, newsletter. And one of the things they said here, uh, th as you know, they're still on deputation. Uh, they are right now around the 50% mark. And so I want us to pray specifically that God would get them all the way and get them out on the field as soon as possible. Let's just pray that they would get enough churches. And I also want to do the same thing uh, for uh, uh, Jackson. What's her first name? Grace Jackson. Uh, she is much higher. I think her, what is it? Uh, 70%. Let's just pray that the Lord would push them over uh, to get uh, their full support so they can get out on the field. So let's pray much in prayer for, uh, for the two of them, for Grace and for the Donahoe's. Now, the last thing is we have a little short video. Uh, as you know, uh, Brother Goddard had his car wrecked and some other things happened, but he sent us a little video. Are we ready to play that? Okay, watch up here on the monitors. Hey, how are you doing? My name is Josiah Goddard, missionary to Trinidad and Tobago. and got some exciting updates for you. We're basically done with deputation on our way to Trinidad, and we're excited. We're planning on moving at the very beginning of June. We've got a shipping container we're loading at the beginning of May, and things are coming along. We're excited about getting to our field, and 
not having to drive all over the country gathering support anymore, and God's been good to us. I want to tell you about a few of the blessings we've had just recently. We've had almost 3,000 Bibles delivered to us from the um, Bible and Literature Missionary um, Foundation out of Shelbyville, Tennessee. They just, at no cost, printed, um, I think, tw about 2,700 Bibles, sent them to, to us, took care of it all. They are such a blessing to us, um, getting us those Bibles to bring down with us. And then um, just th this week, uh, um, I'm about to go pick up some Chick tracks from Chick, Chick Publications, the comic book tracks, going to pick up 55,000 of those. And Man, I can't believe there's so many blessings we've had. When I first mentioned we're going to start gathering some money and funds for the needs we had coming up, I didn't even put out a list yet. And Central Baptist Church of Sutherland, Oregon sent us $1,000 almost immediately just to be a help and be a blessing. And thank you so much to them. There's been a lot more that's been done, just blessings that have come in. I know the kids class in my home, Wednesday night kids class in my home church have just told us that they're going to um, help buy some of the things that we need to bring down with us. And a bunch of fifth and sixth graders raising money to help a missionary. Isn't it a blessing these kids are given young? And got some things if you would consider um, praying about and possibly giving to help fill one of these needs. I have a whole list of things that we're going to buy to bring down with us since we're bringing the container for the Bibles from the tracks. Um, one of the things, the kids are going to help cover some of the costs for these, but I want to bring down some giant soccer balls, kickballs, um, volleyballs, things like that for teen activities, youth programs, stuff like that. And the giant ones, they add a new element of fun. And we could get a normal soccer ball down there, but anything extra or different, it's really hard to get down there. So we're going to bring those down, basically $10 a piece. So two each with three different things, that'd be $60. And the kids, I think, are going to cover at least half of that, maybe a little bit more, depending on what they raise this next week or two. Um, but they're going to help cover that. I would like to raise about $300 for um, video equipment. That is high-quality mics. That's good quality um, a stand and stuff to use for my phone. So that way I could get update videos, video, different programs, things going on, and just something that will help it be a better quality um, that we could put out. And then the other thing along those lines that we're raising money for, and this will be a huge blessing if someone can help cover this need, is we want a portable PA system. Talking pastors down there, they don't have a hard time getting something to work inside of a small auditorium, but their big struggle is getting something good and effective for outdoor services. Because often it's in a random field, you have to worry about power. Through a friend of mine who's an audio dealer, I've got an incredible deal, and I could get battery-operated sound system that could work up to 1,000 people for $2,500. Incredible setup, everything we would need, portable, simple, easy, and be a huge blessing if someone could donate that $2,500 to help cover that sound system. We would use it when we start our church, um, for our church too, but the main purpose would be to help with the revivals, the vacation Bible schools, any outreach, street preaching, things like that, where we could spread the gospel and just try to be more effective with what we have. Um, and if we aren't able to raise $2,500, there's another option. That'll work good. It's just not as portable. It'll weigh about three times as much, be way bigger, and that's about $1,500. So we're trying to raise somewhere between $1,500 and $2,500 for, for a PA system. And then one of the blessings we have going down there is working with a national pastor. I've asked his church, what him and um, secretary, what can I bring to help the ministry that we're going to start working with? One of the things they need is a printer, high-quality printer that they could print flyers for big days, promotions, stuff like that. They could print material to help train new converts. There's nothing you could buy. Here in America, we got Christian bookstores. You order stuff online. There's nothing like that in Trinidad. So anything they're giving to a new convert of, here's something you need to study, you need to learn, let us trade material to help teach the new Christians, they, they have to print it themselves. So we're looking to bring down a printer because theirs is starting to go out. We're looking to bring down a spiral binding machine and the coils and the materials to help just make it books. Right now, they're trying to, Make, doing a makeshift binding with tape and other stuff. but It's not effective, doesn't last long. And getting a spiral bind, binding machine and the coils and a printer would make that part of the ministry so much more effective. Be able to print books, um, help grow new converts, and take people just fr um, from the, I'm saved, I'm going to heaven, now what's next? And help them have the material knowledge and something that they could take home and have on a bookshelf so they have an answer when they have a family member who's not saved, who asked them the question, they could have that answer on hand. But the printer we're looking to raise between two and $400. We're 
the spiral binding machine is about three hundred dollars and then about another three hundred dollars for all the coils now it will be for song books for um doctrine books for other um christian growth material and then i'm asking if there's a church um specifically if there's a church who've recently gotten new song books if you would consider donating 50 to 100 song books that we could bring down mail them to our church so we could um to my home church so we could bring them load them into the container bring them down with us and hymn books are very hard every church i know of down there that has hymn books has gotten them from a church in the states we love to bring down enough hymn books for our church and maybe another church too and Maybe if you have a bookstore that sells some books and you'd like to donate those, that would work. But honestly, we're, not, we're, we're happy to take the used ones that your church is replacing if there's someone who'd like to donate those. And then some other needs. We have communion trays and the cups, offering plates, all those things. Easy to get here in America. Not, not very easy to get in Trinidad. Um, looking at the communion trays for the juice and the bread is about $120 for um, all of that. Communion cups, get a thousand pack for $20. Um, offering plates. Get a um, couple of those for seventy dollars. None of those items in there on their own is very expensive. It'd be easy for a Sunday school class, a church. Some hey, let's help cover these needs if you'd consider doing that. Another thing is there's people who could build pulpits down there, but if we have the space, we could bring a pulpit and probably save money rather than having to pay someone to do it down there so we could use a pulpit. And then with us moving, our container costs five thousand dollars in the U.S. side, probably another fifteen hundred dollars to clear customs in the port down in Trinidad. That's about 6500 maybe up to 7000 that we need to raise to get everything down there. I know um, we've already had a $1,000 love offering. Had a couple of pastors tell me they're going to see what they can help with. But if you'd consider helping with getting that container down, the big reason we're bringing the container was it wasn't going to be worth it just for our own stuff. Because we're going to be able to bring down a lot of our own things and just the conveniences of having stuff from America. But the reason we decided to do the container was when I was there in January, Almost every church said we're running out of Bibles, we're running out of tracks. And so my goal is to bring those Bibles we got donated, probably 100, 150,000 tracks down with us. And a couple other ministries I've talked to that have said they probably could help us, and we're just waiting to see how many exactly they could send. But this $5,000 per container is so that Bibles and tracks could get to the country of Trinidad. And then after that, we're getting vacuum bags, start packing clothes, um, pillows, everything, all the little things like that. We didn't try to utilize the space we're buying some vacuum bags those are only $25 for a big pack of those that we could use and then here's probably the biggest need we have is a vehicle we've been saving money knowing we have to buy a vehicle and get to Trinidad we're going to sell our car here once we move but the money we've been saving up and this is my fault was the cost of what to get a good reliable small vehicle and looking at it is I don't want a vehicle that can't be used for ministry too and so we're looking to raise a little bit extra funds to buy a van that could be used to not just get my family around but also pick up people and bring them into church and just utilize whatever we have for the ministry and that'll be between fifteen twenty thousand dollars maybe a little bit more and we have some saved up um, but we need a little bit more if we're going to be able to get that van and then just a lot of small things we don't want our bibles and tracts that we get to mold while we keep them um, in a garage or the um, extra room in the house we're looking at renting so we're looking at getting a dehumidifier $130 so we don't want to waste what people have sacrificed to give and get to the country. And then we're going to have to furnish a house. House, excuse me. But you consider all the missionaries we have, they all need things. Yeah. And, and that's, just one, that's just one missionary. Uh, but the, one of the reasons I wanted you to see that is because if you feel like the Lord has you know, put a burden on your heart to do something to help, then uh, we would be happy to send that down there for him. And obviously we want to help our missionaries. Once we take them on for support, we want to do what we can. But I just want you to see that he's not the only missionary. All the missionaries have needs just like this. And obviously we can't help everybody with every need, but we can do a little part. So let's, uh, we're stopping right now, but uh, let's also put uh, Brother Goddard uh, on our list or highlight him as well because, you know, he, praise the Lord, he's got all of his support now, and now he's ready to get on the field. And we want him to get on the field just as quickly as possible. So if the Lord has spoken to your heart, then uh, let, let us know, and we'll, we'll do that as well.
We're going to, uh, what we're going to do now is we're just going to, uh, I'm going to pray. We're not going to divide up into groups, but uh, hopefully you have your prayer bulletin and in your prayer bulletin, what you're doing is you're taking, you're keeping track of these things. You're writing them down. You put this in your Bible and then in the morning when you get up to read your Bible, spend some time praying, go through these prayer requests. Uh, these are real needs. And uh, when you pray, prayer works, prayer helps, prayer makes a difference. And as the Lord uh, puts things on your heart, uh, maybe the Lord will lead you to send some money and, uh, and we'll be able to help with that as well. But let's go ahead and pray and then uh, we'll continue the service. Our Father, we thank you now for Central Baptist Church. And Lord, I thank you for the folks that are here tonight, uh, eager and, and ready to hear from your word. And Lord, we thank you that we have a praying church and a missions-minded church. And here are missionaries that have needs. Lord, just one missionary alone, you know, you're, it sounds like he needs forty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000. And, and Lord, uh, we don't know exactly what your will is, but Lord, we pray that you might supply the Goddard's needs. Lord, we pray that you might help him to get out on the field. And Lord, especially to get those Bibles and those tracts over there. Lord, we pray that as a result of his enthusiasm and his excitement, that there will be many, many people saved as a result of his ministry. And Lord, we, we want to have a part in those people being saved. Lord, we thank you for Brother Rue. We thank you for the trip that he just had and the safety that you gave him. And Lord, how people were saved as a result of his trip. Lord, we thank you for Brother Robinette. And Lord, we thank you for the 316 souls that were saved on his last trip to India. Lord, we pray for Grace uh, Jackson that you'll help her to get the rest of her support so she can get on the field. Uh, Lord, we pray for the Donahoes. We pray that you might help them to get all their support. And, and Lord, then uh, in, our, in our bulletins tonight, we have uh, other missionaries. Lord, we're praying for uh, also for Brother Wells. And Lord, we thank you for all the things that are, that are going on uh, with Brother Wells there in Papua New Guinea. And then, Lord, uh, we have a number of people that uh, need to be saved. Lord, there's a whole list of folks that we're praying for their salvation. There's a whole list of people that have health issues. Lord, we pray that you might have your will and your way in the lives of all these people. And, Lord, we pray, obviously, for these missionaries. And so, Lord, uh, we ask tonight that you might Bless the service. We pray that you might answer these requests. Uh, Lord, we just want to thank you for your goodness. And Lord, without you, we can't do anything. Without you, these missionaries could do nothing. Without, without you, these people won't be saved. Lord, uh, these people that have health issues. Uh, Lord, we continue to think about Katie. And Lord, we, it was a blessing to see her on Sunday night. Lord, I pray that you might continue to heal her. Uh, Lord, uh, Brother uh, Keith Blair has been visiting our church and he shared with me the severe back issues that he's been having. And Lord, we pray for him that, uh, that he'll get some relief from the problems that he's been having. And Lord, there are just uh, so many requests. Uh, we're praying for Jojo Maxwell. Next week, she's gonna be going back to Mayo. And Lord, I know this is a burden on, uh, on Brother Scott and his wife. And I pray that you might uh, do a miracle in her life as well. Lord, I know that there are many unspoken requests and uh, requests that are uh, just too personal and private to mention. We pray that you might answer those as well. And then, Lord, we just pray that you might be with the remainder of this service tonight. We thank you for what you're going to do, for it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Let's. Our chorus is Psalm 75 in your booklets, page 24. <clears throat> Unto thee, O God, do we give thanks. Unto thee do we give thanks. For that thy name is near, thy wondrous works declare. For that thy name is near, wondrous works declare.
Just a couple announcements very quickly. Uh, there's not a lot more left uh, during the month of April. Uh, we are having the college and career uh, Bible study coming up on the 26th. And then uh, there is a teen activity. So if you have any questions about those, see Brother Mike or, or um, see Brother Gabriel. But one of the things I want to mention, especially for the ladies, is we're going to do something very special. Uh, there's a ladies' fellowship luncheon now. It's not coming up until May. However, uh, this one's going to be a little different. Instead of having uh, the activity here, we're going to be having it at uh, the Mimi's Cafe. And uh, there's a special menu. The cost is $30 per person. We are going to be putting out uh, a little... Uh, a, a, a little insert in the bulletin so that you can sign up for that. But uh, you get to choose what you want to eat, and then uh, we're going to have a very special speaker for that. That's the Saturday before Mother's Day. So any of the ladies that are interested in that, if you have any questions, you can see Sandy, but that's coming up May the 11th, 11.30. It's at the Mimi's right here on uh, over in Tustin, and the cost is $30 per person. And then it's not too early, but we're going to be doing something a little different this year. Uh, our 15th anniversary is coming up at the end of May, Amen. and so Amen. we're going to be uh, we're going to be a fully grown teenager at uh, age of 15, and we've got some special things that we're going to do this year, and we're going to be telling you more about that. But we want you to start praying for the 15th anniversary Sunday. Uh, the entire month of May is going to be called Anniversary Month, amen. and then um, Amen. The week before Anniversary Sunday, we're calling it Anniversary Week. And uh, you're saying amen. You have no idea what you're about to... <laughs> you have no idea what you're about to get into. But we're going to be printing up thousands of flyers, and we're going to be getting a map, and we're going to be meeting every night during Anniversary Week. Uh, and we're going to be having some meals, and then we're going to go out. We're going to hand out some flyers, and we're going to mark the map, and we're going to see how many people we can talk to, and then we'll have a little work day. And then Sunday, uh, uh, May the 25th, we're going to see if we can't just pack this place out and yeah. preach the gospel. So we got a lot of work to do to get to that point. So what I would like to have you do is just every day when you pray, pray for Anniversary Sunday. It's going to be a, it's going to be a highlight this year. We're going to make Amen. a big deal out of it. Amen. 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 Let's sing. Shall we do our memory verse, Psalm 86, 6 and 7? I think it's in your prayer bulletins. <clears throat> shall we quote it? Ready, begin. Psalm 86, 6 and 7. Give ear, O Lord, unto my prayer, and attend to the voice of my supplications. In the day of my trouble, I will call upon thee, for thou wilt answer me. Amen. Stand with me one more time for song number 688. Oh, that will be glory. Song number 688.
Let's have a word of prayer. Uh, Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for um, sending your Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and uh, to um, save us, Lord. And um, I thank you that uh, we can come to church. I want to pray for our tithes and offerings tonight as a church, especially as we uh, were um, learning about the different needs for our missionaries, Lord. Um, I pray that you just help us to give uh, what you put on our heart, and I pray that it would be a blessing, Lord. Your word says in Proverbs 10.22, the blessing of the Lord, and make it rich, and he addeth no sorrow with it. So I do ask that you would put a blessing upon this church and our giving, and um, I pray, Father, that we would uh, see fruit that remains as a result, and uh, I just want to ask that you bless our tithes and bless our offerings and uh, maybe even multiply them if, if possible. Uh, and I give it to you, Lord. So I just wanna say thank you, Lord. Uh, please bless the rest of this night and uh, please let your perfect will be done from this moment until the moment we meet you. And that truly will be glory for us when we finally get to see you. And I can't wait to see you, Lord. I can't wait to be in glory. Um, until then, help us to be faithful. For it's in Jesus' name I pray, amen. You may be seated. By the way, um, for those of you that remember the Bennetts, Kelly Bennett, she had the double lung transplant. I was talking to uh, Brother Larry. We were texting the other day, and they are planning, if the medication works out and everything works out, they want to try to come to church either at the end of April or beginning of May. Now, that would be a great miracle as well. So be much in prayer for, for her also. All right, Revelation. We're in the book of Revelation, chapter number 3. Revelation chapter number three. Uh, this is spring break for Master Club, so we've got the uh, Master Club people in here. It's good to see them. And uh, hey, guys, how you doing? You're in the right place. Amen. You're in the right spot. All right. Um, it's, it has been uh, a few weeks. It seems like it's been a long time since we've been in Revelation. So just uh, we want to back up a little bit, just review a couple things and and, and kind of get caught up. And what we're doing right now is we are discussing, looking at, preaching, teaching on the letters to the seven churches. 
And so uh, go back to uh, Revelation chapter 1, verse number 10. Notice it says, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and behind me a great voice as of a trumpet saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. And what thou seest, write in a book and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia. And then they're listed, Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. And that's what we're looking at. We're looking at each of those individual churches. So let's, uh, let's have a word of prayer. Father, now as we uh, have our Bible study tonight, Lord, we pray that you might uh, educate us. I pray that the Holy Spirit might reveal things to us uh, that we can use in a practical way. Lord, I pray that you might help us to use this as we uh, witness to, to folks and as we try to get the gospel out. And Lord, I pray that you might bless our study tonight. We thank you for what you're going to show us, for it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So keep in mind that uh, these seven churches were local churches. They were in existence during the time of John. And so one of the applications as we go through these is to keep in mind that these were churches that were functioning during uh, John's time, and the Lord had something to say to them. Doctrinally, uh, these, this uh, information that's in here is aimed at churches in the Great Tribulation. Although the church is not mentioned once the church is raptured, there will be churches during the time of the Tribulation. Um, spiritually, uh, the picture, of course, uh, shows from the church age, uh, the first coming, all the way up to the second coming. And then uh, personally, we can always apply the things that we learn to, our, to ourselves personally to help us uh, to discern good and bad, to, to discern evil in our lives. Of course, we know the Bible says that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. So even if you're reading somewhere in uh, the Law of Moses, you're reading the Pentateuch, or you're reading something back here, in Revelation, you think, well, that doesn't really apply to me. That's future. That's prophecy. You know, that's for the Jews. There is something in everything for you. And you want to ask the Holy Spirit to reveal those things to you. Now, just as a reminder, the church at Ephesus historically was the apostolic church. We're talking about AD 33 to about AD 200. The foundation of that church was the apostles. And uh, after the death of all the apostles, we had what we call the, the apostolic fathers. And there were names, uh, if you don't know church history, these names might not be familiar to you. But if you do, you have names like Polycarp and Ignatius and Justin Martyr. Uh, but the problem with this church is uh, after the apostles died, there were people in the church that were teaching apostolic succession. And they... Uh, they, which is heresy, by the way. And so uh, they were doctrinally sound. They were separated, but they began to be a little bit ritualistic. And uh, the church was known for its works. It was known for its labor. It was known for its patience and its intolerance. However, it had become so ritualistic that they had left their first love. And of course, the Bible says they need to repent. Now, the church at Smyrna, we said that the word Smyrna means myrrh. And uh, that's, a, that's a, bitter, uh, it's a bitter plant. This is the church period from about 200 A.D. up to about 350 A.D. And this is the period of time where pagan Rome, not uh, papal Rome, but pagan Rome, persecutes the church. And uh, one of the great blasphemies and heresies that was being taught during this period is that uh, God was all through with the Jews. And uh, the church had replaced the Jews during this period. Uh, but this was also a church filled with trouble. And God uh, foresaw the trouble that they were going to be going through. But he didn't, uh, he didn't do anything to remove the trouble. He said, be prepared for it. He said, you're going to be going through trouble. So he exhorted them, you're going through trouble, so you need to be faithful. And, you know, that's a problem that we have even in our time. We're so soft and we're such big babies that even the slightest little thing that happens in our life causes us to quit. Uh, it's very, it's a very, it's a sad thing that more people aren't faithful to the things of God, faithful to the church and faithful to their ministry. 
And uh, it doesn't take much to knock somebody out. Just a little hangnail, you know, or somebody just looks at you funny and you think, oh, well, they don't like me. Well, I'm just quitting. That's a different lesson. All right. So uh, then the third church was the Pergamus. Now, the, that period was about 325 to 500. Some of these periods overlap, and these aren't exact dates. Uh, people will differ on the dates, but this, this is the third church period. And this is where Rome begins to accept the church. The word Pergamus means much married. And the problem was that this church had now joined itself to the world. And uh, this is the period where the Roman Catholic Church began to rear its head. And uh, this church now was living under Papal Rome. Uh, pagan Rome was now passed. Now it's living its Papal Rome. And so during this period, uh, the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, and that's, the, that's where the clergy supposedly, or they believe the clergy conquers the laity and kind of lords over them. And so uh, uh, that, that was something else that was evil. They were told to repent. The clergy is not above the laity. Uh, the pastors are not above. Everybody's on the same level. But that's, uh, that's kind of the Catholic church for you. Now, the third church or the fourth church was Thyatira. And that means odor of affliction. And this period is about 500 A.D., and it goes right into the heart of the Dark Ages, probably around 1,000 A.D. Uh, this is Rome now completely controlling the church. This was the most persecuted church of all. And the Bible talks about uh, a woman named Jezebel. We're going to talk about her a little bit later. But Jezebel, who's teaching false doctrine, uh, fornication, worshiping idols, uh, this is the absolute darkest time in the history of the church. Uh, this is when the, uh, the Roman Catholic Church ruled with an iron fist. You notice that uh, things never get better. They always get worse. They always degrade. You can see what's happening in, in our day and age. But now after these four church periods had passed, the end result of all this is now we have Roman Catholicism. And that's what happens. Now, I want you to go to chapter 3 and verse number 1, and we're going to look at our fifth church, which is the church uh, Sardis. Notice it says in verse 1, And unto the angel of the church in Sardis write, These things saith he that hath the seven spirits of God and the seven stars, I know thy works that thou hast a name, that thou livest and art dead. Uh, and by the way, if, I don't know if everybody got your notes that we inserted. Okay, you have that? Okay. Very good. You did good. Now you have to have a pen to write the answers with. There you go. All right, look at everybody's doing their homework. Nobody gets to stay for detention. You did good. You brought your textbook? Okay, you got your notes, you got your pen. All right, what more can I ask? All right, so Sardis means red ones. Sardis means Red ones. Now, these saints are not called red ones for nothing. Um, this age is typified by martyrdom and bloodshed. So that's what uh, number two is. This age was typified by martyr and bloodshed. This is the age that spawns the absolute murder of Bible-believing Christians by the thousands. Um, during this time period... <coughs> Uh, you're familiar with uh, terms like the Spanish Inquisition. That's what's going on. Uh, there's the massacre of the Huguenots, which was a good group of Bible-believing people, this, what they call the St. Bar Bartholomew Day Massacre. And what that was was that was the Pope, the Catholic Pope, uh, giving a medal, a medal to Catholics who were armed and basically, they had permission to go in and kill all the unarmed Protestants. And if you kill Protestants, you would, you would earn a medal. Uh, so here, here you had demon-possessed popes that uh, they didn't care who they killed. They didn't care if they were killing a woman or an infant. Uh, if you were not Catholic, if you were, if you were a Protestant, then you deserve to die. And they were basically giving permission for people to be murdered. This is when Rome was at the absolute peak of her power. This is when Rome was, uh, even kings and uh, 
governmental society was trembling at the power of the Catholic popes. Uh, you know, listen, during that time period, Rome didn't hesitate to, uh, to burn Christians at the stake for things like this, rebaptizing a new believer. In fact, that's uh, number three. You know, when a person, uh, when a, if, you, if you are part of the Catholic Church, obviously they're going to they're gonna baptize you, sprinkle you as a baby. And, and so that's it. They don't think you need to be baptized. Well, one of the reasons that uh, we are called Baptists, you know, we were re-baptizers. When a person truly trusted Christ as their Savior and they understand that they're saved, they're going to follow the Lord in believer's baptism. They need to be baptized properly and correctly. And so we would re-baptize them in the eyes of the Catholic Church. They were being baptized again. Well, uh, if, you, if you promoted that, you could be burned at the stake for re-baptizing somebody. Not only that, but uh, when the preacher would get up and talk about the little wafer that the Catholic Church would serve, um, they would say, you know, that's, that's symbolic, but the Catholic Church taught, no, that's the literal body of Christ. You could be put to this, burned at the stake for that. Uh, you could be burned at the stake for speaking out against the corruption of the Catholic Church. If you refuse to worship Mary, you could be burned at the stake. Uh, if you refuse to have your baby sprinkled, there were many, many people that were martyred because they refused to have their baby sprinkled. That's not Bible. And, uh, and that's what the Catholic Church was doing. And so, for example, just me getting up and talking about this, if we, if we, were, if we had our church during that time period, I could be arrested and, and uh, tortured and burned at the stake just for what I'm saying right now. And you understand that these are our forefathers. They were willing to go through this, and we have what we have today because of them. Um, if you read... If you read the Fox's Book of Martyrs, and I don't know if any of you have that, but every Christian ought to have a couple of books. One of them is Fox's Book of Martyrs. You ought to have Pilgrim's Progress. But uh, Fox's Book of Martyrs uh, outlines some of, the, some of the ways that Christians were killed and tortured, really in the most depraved and, and the sickest way possible. Uh, and, this, and these are people claiming to be Christians. Catholics. So the Sardis period begins about 1,000 A.D. It goes right into the middle of the Dark Ages, which would be around 1,500 A.D. Uh, it begins with the Crusades. You've heard about the Crusades in history, uh, the invasions of people like Genghis Khan and Saladin. Uh, there was the Hundred Years' War between England and France, which was actually longer than 100 years, but uh, 1337 to 1450. It was also during this time that uh, Hindu philosophy and Muslim philosophy began to come up through Spain and up through Greece. And, and all that happened because of the Crusades. But something else was happening during this time which was good. Above all this, uh, this is a time where uh, we'll see the multiplication of the Greek Textus Receptus manuscripts. And these are the manuscripts that the King James translators used these were found in the Greek Orthodox Church. And what happened is these manuscripts, the Textus Receptus, uh, traveled up through Hungary. And, uh, and by the way, um, there's, I, I've told you about this before, uh, but there's a lady I'm praying for. Her name is Esther, and her husband's name is Frank. They're from Hungary, and uh, they're part of my dog-walking ministry. And uh, I invited them to come on Easter. They, they didn't come for Resurrection Sunday, but they're from Hungary. Uh, but these manuscripts up through Hungary and Bohemia and Bulgaria, and then they traveled up into Germany, which is where we learn all about Martin Luther and how he, he changed the world. Now, here's the thing that I want you to understand. Uh, a thousand years previous to this time, uh, you'll notice that if you study church history, that God never used the, the, the Latin Bibles of the Roman Catholic Church. There's never been any kind of revival or change with, those, with that line of manuscripts. Uh, anything that came up through Augustine or Origen uh, or, up through Al or down through Alexandria, Egypt, uh, that line of manuscripts was nothing but spiritual degeneration and spiritual corruption. And God has never used those manuscripts. The revivals have all come from 
uh, the King James Bible and its family and the Texas Receptus. And, 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 no, and you can't deny that. So that's where we see the difference. Now, Romans, or, I'm sorry, Revelation 3, 1 again. Uh, I want you to see something about this church, though. The very end of the verse says, I know thy works, that thou hast the name that thou livest, and art dead. So the Lord knew the works of this church exactly like he knew the works of the other churches. And this particular church had this reputation that they were alive, but it was dead. They had a membership that was growing, but the members in the church weren't growing. And so uh, this church in Sardis, uh, there, this was the, uh, the remnant of uh, Roman Catholic Church. They had a name for their orthodoxy. So here's people in the church. You know, they believed in the fundamentals of the faith. They believed in the Apostles' Creed, the virgin birth. But they were just spiritually dead. And so it had a name that it lived, but yet it didn't live at all. So by about A.D. 1000... Uh, the, the Catholic Church was just as spiritually dead as can be. In fact, it's nothing but a corpse right now. Uh, whereas the true church is not, we're not just a, look, we're not just a, uh, a group that gets together uh, like the mooses and the gooses and the lodges and all the different clubs, you know, the women's auxiliaries. And, and, and even, and, and I have great respect for uh, American Legion in the, and the men that served and the women that served our country. But those are just organizations that get together and uh, they, they relive the past and they do some good deeds. But uh, we're not just an ecclesiastical organization. What we are is we're a living body. And this is uh, something that's alive. Uh, during this time period, even though the Catholic Church was predominant, there were a few lights. There were some folks within this church that, uh, that you might have heard, heard their names. There's groups called the Huguenots and the Waldensians and the Albigenses. You would call them red ones because they stood up and led movements against the Roman Catholic Church. And they shed their blood so that we could have the Bible in our language today. You, we owe them a great debt of gratitude for them sacrificing their lives so we could have our Bible today. Uh, look at uh, Romans, or, I'm sorry, Revelation chapter 3. Look at verse 2. It says, Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die, for I have not found thy works perfect before God. Remember therefore how thou hast received and heard, and hold fast and repent. If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come upon thee as a thief, and thou shalt know not, thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. Now, these verses uh, doctrinally uh, uh, are for the tribulation. We can make an application of the church age. But this passage right here actually goes with uh, a passage that we're going to get to in Revelation chapter 16 uh, that talks about the coming as a thief in the night. It's also Matthew 24 and 25. When we get to Revelation Chapter 16, we're going to cover that a little bit more. But uh, notice in verse number 4. Thou hast a few names, even in Sardis, which have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. Notice that phrase, walk with me in white. Uh, the Bible in Revelation talks a lot about these white robes, and you might have heard that. These white robes are the righteousness of the saints. Uh, look down at verse number 18, same chapter. Notice it says here, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire that thou mayest be rich and white raiment that thou mayest be clothed. Uh, go to chapter 16. Go to Revelation 16. Look down here at verse number 15. He says, Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. Now, what I want you to understand is that these garments are, are what we call earned works. Uh, we, uh, we, uh, uh, we have white robes that are washed in the blood of the Lamb. But these garments here are the righteousness of the saints themselves. Now, watch this. Go to Revelation chapter 19 and go down to verse number uh, 8. Revelation 19, 8. 
And he said unto me, Right, blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. That's not the verse I want. Let's see, where is the verse? Verse 8. I was reading verse 9. I'm so excited to eat at the marriage supper of the Lamb. I can't wait for that. Big, big uh, fried chicken from Popeye's and... No, that's that's probably, it's a heavenly donuts. That's what it is. All right, verse eight. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. For the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. So let me explain what that is. After you trusted Christ as your Savior, God expects you to do right. And so th these these are the good works that a Christian does after he gets saved. You know, one of, the, one of the downside people think about being a Baptist that we get accused of is, uh, well, you get saved and you're guaranteed to go to heaven and you can live your life any way you want. And that's true. You can. You go to heaven. You don't have to go to church. You don't have to go soul winning. You don't have to read your Bible. You don't have to do anything. But you're going to wish you did. You're going to wish you did. And uh, when we stand before the judgment seat of Christ... Uh, you want to make sure that you found yourself clothed in righteousness at the judgment seat. The Bible says that we, all, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Don't think that you can just do whatever you want and get away with it. Uh, we have an obligation unto the Lord to live a righteous and a holy life and to live a life of good works, not to get to heaven, but to please the Lord. And we've talked about that before. So, in, uh, go back to chapter 3. <coughs> uh, verse number 4. This verse shows us that there, are, there were still a few people standing for right and still preaching the truth during this time period. Uh, you know, there were, there were groups called the Anabaptists. There were Waldensians. There were Lollards. There were groups called Paulicians. And uh, these people who are our forefathers, were branded as heretics by the official Roman Catholic Church, people that believed exactly the way we believe. And so uh, notice something interesting here in verse number 5. It says, He that overcometh, the same shall be clothed in white raiment, and I will not blot his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. Uh, for those of you that go out soul winning and visiting and you might talk to other groups that do not believe in eternal security, uh, this is a verse that they like to use to prove, they think they're proving that you can lose your salvation, that your name can be blotted out. And I don't know if you've run into anybody like that. Um, they believe that this is one of the great verses to prove that you can lose your salvation. That's how they rest the scriptures. But if you look at this verse very carefully, you're going to see it's not a threat. What it is, it's a promise. You cannot lose your salvation. Notice it says, He that overcometh, I will not blot out his name. Now here's where, here's where they get messed up. They say, well, if you don't overcome, then your name is going to be blotted out. But I want to remind you, go back to 1 John chapter number 4. 1 John chapter 4. When you start comparing Scripture with Scripture, you're going to find out that this is a blessed promise, not a threat. Look at chapter 4 and look down at verse number 4, 1 John. It says, Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them. Why? Because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. We've already overcome because of Christ. Go to chapter 5 and look down at verse number 4. It says, for whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. When you got saved, you became born, born again. Are you born of God? Yes, if you're born of God, then you've already overcome the world. That's what the Bible says. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Listen, when, when you trust Jesus Christ as your Savior, you've already overcome. And so if somebody says to you, hey... Uh, let me show you how you can lose your salvation. All right, let's compare Scripture with Scripture, and let's find out here. Uh, Revelation 3, 5 is a promise that by believing in the Lord Jesus Christ, you will not be blotted out of the book of life. So don't let anybody take that verse and twist it all around. Now, uh, Revelation chapter 3, verse number 6. 
Let's go there. Revelation 3, verse number 6. Um, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Now, keep in mind again that this is a time of bloody persecution. Uh, but there are some great preachers that lived during this time. You might have heard of uh, a guy named Wycliffe. Uh, you might have heard of John Huss or Savonarola. Uh, there was a guy named Peter Waldo. He's the founder of the Waldensians. Tyndale, Wycliffe, Huss, Savonarola, John Colette, William Rubrick, Rubrick, uh, Vincent Farrar. Uh, these are great preachers that preached the gospel and preached the truth in Germany and in Switzerland and in France and in Spain. And they spoke out very uh, heavily against the Roman Catholic Church. And a lot of these guys were burned at the stake. Uh, this is the period of time where there were street preachers all over Europe. And uh, they were preaching the book of Revelation and they were exposing uh, Rome for what she was. In fact, let me show you, let me show you some of what they preached. Take your Bible and go to Revelation chapter 17. This is some of the stuff that they were preaching. Revelation chapter 17. Look at verse number 1. I'm going to show you something interesting. If you've not seen this before, maybe you have, but this will be, uh, this will be an eye-opener again. Verse 1. And there came one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials, and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither, I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters. Wow, that's, a, that's kind of harsh. You call a woman a great whore. And it says, With whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have made, been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. Now, I want you to notice how closely that verse resembles a verse that we, a couple verses that we've already read. Hold your place in Revelation 17 and go back again to Revelation chapter 2. All right? Now, watch this, and you'll see how this all, you'll see how our King James Bible uh, explains things and how when you compare Scripture with Scripture. All right? So we talked about the great horror. We've talked about the kings of the earth have committed fornication and have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. Now watch Revelation 2, verse 14. I have a few things against thee, because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed unto idols, and to commit fornication. Now if that's not enough, go to chapter 2, verse 20. Now, here we talk about that woman. Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee, because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess, and teach and to seduce my ser uh, servants to what? To commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. And so what you've got here is uh, you've got uh, uh, the same thing that's being taught during a couple of these church periods, and then all of a sudden you get to Revelation 17 and you find out who this Jezebel was. This Jezebel is the great whore. And uh, there's no doubt about who that is. Go back to Revelation 17 now. Let's show you some things. All right, we're talking about uh, committed fornication and drunk with the wine of her fornication. All right, now look at 17 verse number 18. The woman which thou sawest is that great city which reigneth over the kings of the earth. So here's a woman that is said to be a city. And it's a great city that rules over the kings of the earth. Do you know any city like that? We'll get more of a description. It's, it's you know, a city that reigns over the kings of the earth? It's Rome. All right, let's go back and look at uh, verse number 8, 17 and verse number 8. Watch this. The beast that thou sawest was and is not it shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition. They that dwell on the earth shall wonder whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world when they behold the beast that was and is not and yet is. And here is the mind that hath wisdom. Seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. You know any city that 
that rules over the kings of the earth that's built on seven mountains, if you know geography. Uh, it's not a matter of interpretation. It's Rome. Rome sits on seven hills. Look at verse 6. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. <coughs> All right, so here's a city. It's a great city. It's built on seven mountains. It reigns over the kings of the earth. And it has killed the martyrs of Jesus Christ. Did we just not read about all that? The people that were killed, put to death at the stake? Look at verse number 4, 17.4. Here's some more. The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet colored, decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand, full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. All right? Here's a city. It's a great city. It's built on seven mountains. It reigns over the kings of the earth. It has killed and made martyrs out of those who believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. And her colors are purple and scarlet, and her symbol is a cup. Now, the Holy Spirit wrote this, and the Holy Spirit was very precise in its wording, and it named her in its very precise terminology here. And so here in Revelation 17, you have these street preachers during this time period that are getting up and they're denouncing uh, the Pope. They're denouncing the church. Uh, they're preaching this in the European Holy Roman Empire. Now, it's during this time period. Again, there's more things that happen here. Um, this is when Columbus discovers America. What's the poem? In 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue. Now, of course, we're denouncing him, you know, in the public schools and all that because he's so evil. This is when the Renaissance was rolling in. Uh, this is when the Bible was getting printed all over the country, uh, which was the Texas Receptus, uh, the Greek Byzantine uh, Eastern Church. And here are these red ones that shed their blood so that we could have the Bible in our own language today. Now, very quickly here, there's a lesson that I want you to see here in this verse, and then we're going to stop here in a little bit. We'll, we'll stop before 10. <laughs> I want you to realize that, there, that one person can make a difference. I want you to realize that even though you're surrounded by evil and by the philosophy of this world, one person can make a difference. Uh, even if the odds are stacked against you, uh, even if you're literally surrounded by the dominant beliefs and the philosophy of the world, uh, the Roman Catholic Church was at its greatest power during this time period. Uh, they ruled over kings. Kings trembled at the word of the popes in the church. Uh, the religion of the church was stronger than the politics of the world. And uh, there were people that hated their doctrine, but they were afraid, and so they didn't want to speak out. And so here's a man named John Wycliffe. John Wycliffe was called the morning star of the Reformation. One man. He was born in 1324. He died in 1384. And this is what he taught. He taught the idea that if something wasn't in the Bible, it was false. Now, the Catholic Church teaches a lot of stuff that's not in the Bible. But he was willing to get up and say, if it's not in the Bible, it's not true. And he felt so strongly uh, about this idea that he translated the Bible from Latin into the common language of the day. And so in, in, in the Bible, instead of being in some kind of a dark and hidden mystical place or a mystical document that's hidden in a dark place, he wanted to make sure that everybody could read it and everybody could have their own copy and everybody could see the truth for themselves. And John Wycliffe, by himself, made a huge difference. Um, you know, the Bible promises... Um, you don't have to turn here. Uh, but as I've been reading through the... Uh, I've been spending a lot of time in the Pentateuch, and the Lord's been showing me a lot of things. I'm reminded again how God promised Israel that if you'll obey me and you'll trust me and you do what I ask you to do, he says, And ye shall chase your enemies, they shall fall before you by the sword. 
Five of you shall chase a hundred. A hundred of you shall put 10,000 to flight. You know, when you have God on your side, you're in the majority. And here's one man who says, I'm going to stand up for right. I'm going to do what's right. I don't care what the predominant religion is. I don't care how powerful they are. I don't care about their threats. Uh, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna make a difference. So listen, devotionally, you and God are a, are a majority. And so that's kind of the lesson that I want to see. There's a lot of other things and there's a lot of other people. We could talk about Martin Luther and some of the things that he did. But uh, just keep in mind that it doesn't matter what your family and what the boss and what the neighbors believe and all the things that you're seeing on the television and in social media. Uh, and you might be very weird and strange and you might be the only one that believes like you believe. But if you have God on your side, you can make a difference. And you can, you can help change the lives of people just like some of these great men did. All right, next week we're going to talk about uh, Philadelphia. Philadelphia the city of brotherly love, and we're going to talk about that. Somebody told me today, uh, they said, I think that Central Baptist Church is like the Philadelphian church. And I said, praise the Lord. I thought that was a pretty good compliment. I'll take that. If you feel like our church is uh, like the church in Philadelphia, then uh, that's what I want to see here. All right, let's pray. Father, thank you again for today. Lord, we thank you for your word. And Lord, I know we don't do it justice. We we do the best we can as we preach and teach, but Lord, I pray that you might, the Holy Spirit might reveal things that, that I can't reveal. Lord, I pray that the Holy Spirit will put these words down deep into our hearts and convict us where we need to be convicted, teach us where we need to be taught. Lord, I pray that you might bless uh, this evening as we go. I pray that you give us safety, protection, and Lord, bring us back Saturday for uh, visitation and soul winning and and. Uh, working with the, uh, the kids around the neighborhood. And then, Lord, we ask for your blessings on Sunday. We thank you for what you're going to do. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. God bless you. You are dismissed.